Hello, you're watching the Cloud Native Telco Summit, part of our year-round DSP leaders coverage. I'm Guy Daniels, and today we're going to take a closer look at containerized applications and cloud native network functions, CNFs, within the telecoms industry. And joining me now is Francisco Javier Ramon Salguero, who is multi-cloud tools manager at Telefonica and also the chair of the Etsy Open Source Mano Initiative. It's good to see you again, Francisco Javier. It's been a while since we last spoke. Um, a recent report came out early this year from IDC suggested that we are now finally seeing a tipping point in the migration of virtual network functions, VNFs, to CNFs. Do you agree? Is this something you see as well? Well, I would say that uh, that matches uh, the, the perceptions. I mean, that it's, it's true that there is a growing confidence in Telco that uh, CNFs can be suitable for uh, filling many of the use cases. I would say a vast majority of the Telco use cases. And also there is a, so a growing maturity in the offers. So that is helping on, on that. You, you see that the, there are also advantages. I mean, if you are adopting a CNF in comparison with the VNF, it means uh, more predictability, less trouble, more, more, more clarity on the application life cycle. So that is good for the for the long run to understand how to how to manage and how to scale that uh, that piece of software. And and, and also, well, the, the things that uh, since we are having more more offers, we are gaining more experience. I mean. We are also gaining more um, uh, confidence is that the next deployments, if they can be, uh, if the CNF is a suitable uh, uh, option, the, that, that would be the, the preferred option in, in principle. So I, 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 I tend to agree with uh, that perception, perhaps not in the figures because it's, it, the estimations are, are too complicated. But in, in general, I, I have the feeling that this is the, the top one option for, for new deployments. Great. Well, thanks very much for, for that. And we know that um, these organizations do like to produce their figures and uh, and forecasts. And I've got another reference here, another report, this one from, from Gartner, that says in about three years' time or so, well, 2028, more than 95% of global organizations will be running containerized applications in production environments um, up from what they estimate to be about 50% last year. So you know, what's behind this increase? You, you mentioned on your previous answer that you're seeing maturity in CNS, but what, what, what's behind all of this? Well, I, I think that this, the, just to put things in context, I mean, uh, Telco is just uh, another vertical for, for virtualization. Uh, and we have seen uh, this uh, trend already happening in other industries. Uh, so in telco we are following with some delay because the the peculiarities of the type of workloads that we are managing and the ecosystem that is quite special uh, we are seeing that trend uh, emerging a bit later but it is not uh, surprising if you analyze in it in industry in general in in different uh, verticals the adoption i mean you, you are seeing that, uh, I mean, the Kubernetes is everywhere. I mean, there is a large ecosystem around Kubernetes, around the CNCF umbrella. Uh, that means that there are components that are designed specifically to be added on top of your existing deployments to enrich what uh, is there. So, for instance, if I need to encrypt the traffic and my application is not supporting to any traffic encryption, I could, I could add a, a service mesh to encrypt it afterwards. And that works. So we are just seeing the tip of the iceberg in Telco, but uh, this is uh, in behind the scenes. There are a lot of potential that we can that we can unlock. I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, in the coming years we will be seeing in all the the same level of uh, flourishment that has happened in in other uh, 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 IT sectors, uh, so to say. So you already covered the number of key telco use cases there that are now fully supported by CNS. But I'd like to perhaps ask you, you know, where further work is perhaps needed here? We see a lot of disparity. I mean, uh, uh, CNFs that are designed for being interoperable with almost any type of uh, Kubernetes infrastructure, provided that it has the right type of resources and the right amount of them, of course. 
but in some other cases there are CNF that have been designed with a very very specific platform in mind which is the exact opposite of being cloud native right uh, we are still seeing that uh, uh, that orientation for um, verticals and that other uh, ex extreme uh, uh, other end where where there are applications that are designed to to be deployed anywhere right um and i think that we we, we need to to see a convergence there eventually for for applications that are designed for being well-behaved applications in a Kubernetes ecosystem so they can coexist, as, as, as I mentioned, with other tooling that you have there, with your security scans, with your policies, etc., uh, etc., et without being intrusive uh, with them. Still, I mean, there are there are rough edges there in the industry that hopefully we will be will be solving the in the in the coming years. It's, it's a it's a process, and and we, we understand that we that we need to go through through that to, to, to get to that level of, of sophistication. And as you say, it's a process and we will get there as an industry. This, 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 this will come in the, uh, in, in the years ahead. Um, but how does a telco run and manage all of this? How, how, how does a telco actually go about it? And perhaps what are some of the specific benefits of using Kubernetes for cloud native network functions? And you mentioned earlier the declarative nature, for example. I mean, industry is, is going in a, in a direction where you find more and more horizontal deployments as well, which have a lot of benefits because in the end, uh, for new a new piece of software, you don't need to do the low low level design from from scratch. You you, you can start uh, working with uh, the management pure management of software, right? So there is also a, some approaches where are de developing where you you see the more horizontal platforms. At some point. Uh, those horizontal platforms where you have sufficient confidence, we, we are seeing that there are uh, some sort of uh, GitOps in place where they, with well-behaved applications, with applications that do not behave that well, you need to treat them separately and there are in a Pareto rule the 80% of the effort, I'll say. But uh, in that 20% of the effort, that probably is a, is a larger size of the larger share of the uh, deployments, uh, you can start introducing GitOps practices, which simply means that uh, having recording of all those intents of deployment, those uh, declara declarations of intent that you are doing, having them recording in a control system, a version control system, so you, you have a sort of a time machine of what you've been deploying in case that you need to, to roll back or something. That is something that we are we are seeing and actually we, we are working a, a lot in that direction. In the end, what we are trying to achieve, and this is one of the big promises of uh, Kubernetes and this ecosystem around Kubernetes is that it's giving you better robustness and more flexibility combined. So you typically you have a trade-off. You have a trade-off. If I want to be more flexible, I, I, need, to, I need to be less robot, robust because I'm moving faster. But now this technology gives you a, a, it's a leap forward in, in that sense. And that trade-off, the, the equilibrium is somewhere else much farther and you can go much farther in that robustness and that flexibility without compro without compromises if you do it well right and, and that is the direction where we are where we are going now great thanks for explaining that to us and one final question for you and and this is um, based on a couple of questions we've already received in from viewers for the summit uh, and that's the, they mentioned that containers are not monolithic the ecosystem comprises many components can you help explain what some of these components are and why they are important yeah i, I think that that is uh, one of the keys uh, behind the, the kubernetes philosophy and containerization is that i mean in the in the old world of virtualiz virtualization when you created a virtual machine in the end it, it, it was a, a a rough equivalent in a virtual world of a physical machine and how you operated that one that meant that you would put the, in there not only maintaining the operating system, but also maintaining all the set of components and the different versioning that were needed for the application to run inside. And you were putting all that together in a, in a machine like you we've been doing in, in IT for four decades, right? Uh, that is what changes in Kubernetes because I mean the, the problem with, with that approach, which is not a problem because it's been working, but the, the challenge that you have is that in case that works, where's a, a uh, are wrongly in the world tightly couple all the components right and they need to coexist in the same operating system the same versioning and they could be affected 
substantially with any patching or any upgrade that I did to one of the components, right? And that requires to do it successfully a significant knowledge about what was, how was all that ecosystem uh, working together. And you were quite conservative, although in the in the upgrade of the different components, in case that you broke something. That is what the Kubernetes uh, and, and the containers in general allow you to to decouple. I mean, in in the if you, we thought of our server, uh, we had the good old lamp. So you had the Linux, you had the Apache, you had MySQL, right, and and PHP, and all they were combined in a specific versions in a one single in one single machine. Uh, that that is not needed anymore in in a container world where you can decouple and it's, this is the opposite of a of a mo of monolith like the one that I've described. You can put the the database in one place and maintaining an upgrade at its own pace. You can put uh, the the from uh, from services uh, somewhere else. You could put some uh, PHP uh, in other containers and you can maintain them in isolation and still you are declaring how they relate each other. So you don't lose the track of what is going on and how they are relating. But each of the components, in principle, can be can be updated separately, uh, with a stronger confidence that will not affect the rest of the conf the components. Of course, there are there are limitations on this approach, but it's much simpler to to enter in that ecosystem and maintain continuously all the components if they are uh, they are not that tightly coupled. And, and that is that is one of the, the big advantages of, of this approach. Fantastic. Great explanation there. Thank you very much. But we must leave it there for now, Francisco Javier. Good talking with you again. And thanks so much for sharing your views with us today. Now, don't forget to watch all of our videos from this year's Cloud Native Telco Summit. New panels and interviews are available to watch on demand during each day of the event. Goodbye for now.